Maybe I'll start by saying that. Uh, uh, yeah. I was, uh, I was asked by a few. Uh, I hope that. I was asked by Dave Long to uh, uh, give another reason for introducing Dr. Erdogan. Uh, part of the fact that he's he and the Aon Chong are visiting me uh, for a few weeks here in Toronto on a project we're working on. Uh, I'm, uh, I've been at, uh, back and forth between here at Los Alamos Laboratory for the last 12 years, and mostly at Los Alamos, back here every two months or so for a few days. And I'm now uh, uh, transitioning to the war at Toronto, so I will be in Toronto now for most of the time now on. Thank you very much, Phil, for the nice introduction, and thanks to the conference organizers and Dick Bond for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to talk our, about our recent results. As Phil mentioned, I'm actually here to work with Phil. Phil has a wonderful database on rotation measures of extragalactic sources that tell you something about the magnetic cosmic magnetic field and the magnetic field in our galaxy. And we want to find out if we can, can learn something about magnetic fields in galaxy clusters. I want to talk today uh, about some recent results from our cluster redshift survey. And uh, <coughs> I want to focus on three different things. First of all, I want to talk about how we can constrain parameters of cosmological models from our uh, galaxy, redshift, uh, galaxy cluster redshift survey. And uh, I'll talk about what this may imply on uh, massive on the mass of neutrinos in the universe and then we will look at the end of the talk at some aspects about the nearby large scale structure of our universe in terms of superclusters of galaxies and evidence for a local under density in uh, our uh, cosmic neighborhood um, if you want to study cosmologies there are two routes to test our, the cosmological model. One is you can look at the expansion history of the universe, but maybe even more information is encoded in the large scale structure and it evolu its evolution. And that is illustrated in this slide. If you do n-body simulations of the universe we, in different cosmological models and you look at the structure that comes out of the simulations, 
uh, that has been done by our neighbors at MPA in Garching, then you can see that you have distinct different structures for different cosmological models. And that, of course, can be used to test the right cosmology that applies to our universe if we find a way to characterize this structure observationally. You can do that by looking at galaxy distributions. You can do that by, for example, statistics of gravitational lensing by the large scale structure and some other means. We do it by galaxy clusters. So we are looking at very pronounced density peaks in these structures. The clusters are usually these bright spots on the intersection of these filaments. And um, we are using them to characterize the large scale structure. In the sky, a galaxy cluster looks like that. It's an overdensity of galaxies in three dimensions. Its galaxy densities are several hundred times the density in the field. But a cluster is more than just a collection of galaxies. If you look at the same spot in the sky, this is a massive cluster at a redshift of point, around 0.3. If you look at the same spot in the sky in x-rays, and here have, we have the same optical image that we saw before underlaid this contour plot, which are, is, uh, shows the X-ray intensity from that region. We can say, see that this collection of galaxies is actually one connected object, and it's shining in X-rays because the galaxy cluster is filled with hot gas of several 10 million degrees, and this gas is illuminating the whole cluster. And we have such, uh, in this way, a very fortunate situation to characterize galaxy clusters as dark matter halos. That's how theoretic, uh, theoreticians look at it. And we have such a dark matter halo, a huge collection of dark matter mass in the universe with a characteristic form. It forms a gravitational potential that traps the galaxies and traps the gas. The depths of the potential, for example, if you throw in the galaxies and they con you convert their potential energy into kinetic energy, they have in a massive cluster uh, velocity dispersions in, um, of the order of 1,000 kilometers per second. If you do the same with gas, it gets hot and it has a temperature of 10, several 10 million degrees. And this temperature just translates uh, into something which has thermal radiation which comes out in the soft x-ray regime. And that's very nice because it's exactly this uh, regime where we can build x-ray telescope and image these objects. So in, if we compare, for example, galaxy clusters as tracers of the large scale structure compared to galaxies, we have the fortunate situation that galaxy clusters as dark matter halos can be seen by their X-ray radiation in full glory. And we can characterize them. If we look at galaxies, we see a galaxy marking a dark matter halo in which the galaxy resides just in the center. And it's much more difficult to have an idea about the, um, the whole dark matter halo that is marked by these galaxies. So if you want to characterize uh, the structure, of the universe in terms of a hierarchy of dark matter halos. Galaxy clusters are a very nice thing because you see the dark matter halo directly. And you can get an idea about the mass of the whole dark matter halo because we can measure the temperature and density distribution of this hot gas in x-rays. Assuming that the gas sits in here in a hydrostatic fashion, we can solve the hydrostatic equation we get the underlying gravitational potential and the mass of the objects. We will discuss a little bit later more about how good this approximation that we assume that the gas sitting here in hydrostatic fashion, how good it is. But it's a very good first approximation, at least. And um, <coughs> there's one drawback for galaxy clusters. They are these dark matter halos of this size, which have masses for real clusters of 10 to the 14 to 10 to the 15 solar masses, smaller things down to 10 to the so 13 solar masses, we would call poor clusters and groups. They are dynamically young. They haven't had, compared to their dynamical time, they haven't had uh, too much time to get into equilibrium in the universe. And if you look at galaxy clusters, here we have these nice x-ray images that show their full uh, <coughs> morphology. From a sample, a representative sample that should sample all the morphologies um, for 31 clusters, I have picked the six most regular ones here and the six most structured and dynamically ones on the top, on the bottom. 
uh, you can see that there is a difference and that is one of the problems we are fighting with that now of course galaxy clusters are not complete spherical cows we have a variety but their self-similar shapes is still good enough even so we have differences is still good enough that we can describe galaxy clusters by their mean properties for a given mass and the scatter around it the largest difference actually in their morphology is you see that they are scaled in color scale and size so that they, they should look self-similar but they have these bright cores in the center these are so-called cool cores very dense centers of cold gas which doesn't appear so much in these dynamically young ones that's the largest difference between the two in their x-ray properties one possibility to get the, them uh, to describe them better is to just cut out the center we will not do that here but still we have um, clusters are relatively self-similar with a significant scatter around them uh, around their mean properties so this is what we have to work with structure formation theory which I don't want to go into detail too much allows us to calculate how many galaxy clusters should be formed in a certain cosmological model so we have seed fluctuations to begin with in our that's what you uh, for example is done when you do an n-body simulation of the structure of the universe you have to start with seed fluctuations and there are clear recipes how they should like should look like given uh, a statistical fluctuation produced in an inflationary epoch then we have the background cosmology that tells us how the universe as a whole evolves and expands the how the structure forms then and how structure is growing is very much uh, for example a function of the type of matter that makes up the universe and cold dark matter is the one uh, is, uh, gives the name to the mo cosmological model that is most preferred today and then you can from uh, knowing how the large scale structure looks like statistically given for example by a power spectrum of the density fluctuations of the dark matter we can calculate the mass function of galaxy clusters one of the recipes that we are using is it's been published by Tinger et al 2008 so if we do that and uh, calculate a typical mass function we get a curve like that number of galaxies per unit vol number of clusters per unit volume as a function of x-ray luminosity big things are rare the small things are more abundant we get such a curve we change omega m or uh, the density flux the para the normalization of the density fluctuations in the universe today which is given by this parameter sigma 8 uh, if we just change these two parameters these are two of the important six cosmological parameters we see that the mass function is changing significantly uh, even with a small change and this is something we can measure and uh, this is a way how we can constrain different cosmological parameters and these are already the first two most important ones that we will be talking about so now all we what we have to do we have a clear theoretical framework we have clear predictions um, this can be done in a sort of analytic fashion but only at up to a, uh, with an accuracy of about a factor of two but if you calibrate it with large simulations you can get an accuracy to predict this function for a certain cosmological of with an accuracy of almost five percent so we are in a good shape actually to test the cosmological model what we need now is a sample of galaxy clusters from which we can construct such a mass function since galaxy clusters look so nice in x-rays and they are so easy to pick in x-rays and we know if we find x-rays there should be a deep gravitational potential in which they are bound otherwise the gas would not be hot enough to shine in x-rays we are using the Rosat Old Sky Survey uh, Rosat was the only satellite in and uh, instrument which uh, produced an atlas in x-rays of the whole sky with an imaging x-ray telescope so that we have good resolution everything else was done just with a collimator and we have a resolution in the old sky survey of about 1.5 arc minute typically we can see and we have more than 100,000 x-ray sources which have been identified as uh, significant <coughs> x-ray sources in in the survey about 10% of them 
or a little bit less, 8 to 10 percent of them should be galaxy clusters. We are trying to identify these galaxy clusters among the X-ray sources by subsequently going, by successively going down in flux limit so that we try to be always be complete down to a certain flux limit. In a sense, we have only, only scratched the surface of the eight or, hundred, uh, eight or 10,000 galaxy clusters that I think should be in the survey, but represented only by a very few photons. We have identified almost 2,000 of them. And this, in the complete samples, is about 1,800 in the northern sky and in the southern sky, down to a flux limit for people who know these numbers of 1.8, 10 to the minus 12 ergs per second and square centimeter. I will mostly talk about the southern survey. The northern survey is almost complete, but we are missing about uh, 30, 40 redshifts, still two campaigns that are still, uh, have still to be done to complete it. But, um, they are looking relatively similar. <clears throat> OK, after having identified, I mean, the first thing you do is you identify candidates for galaxy clusters out of this X-ray sources. Then you, some of them you can identify for sure by the literature, but a lot of them is left over. And we had more than 50 observing campaigns since 92. It's something which goes on for quite a while. Uh, to first of all make sure that we really have a galaxy cluster there and the second we want to know its distance by measuring the redshift. So we typically have a digital sky image where it, we have an indication of a galaxy cluster. We have the x-ray contours that we can plot on top of the image and then you go to a telescope. You, this is, we have used uh, the 3.6 meter telescope at uh, La Cia, ESO La Cia. 3.5 meter telescope at Carlo Alto and some other observatories, but these are the two main power horses we used for our survey. And uh, so we take about a half, uh, half minute exposure of a cluster without a filter, and then usually you see the galaxy clusters very nicely. We pick uh, a number of galaxies that we put on a multi-slit mask to take spectroscopy of the cluster and we end up uh, with a number of spectra. Most of the time we have five to seven galaxies which turn out to be at the right red, at same redshift or very close to the same redshift Then we know we have a galaxy cluster and we know its distance to us. And from that we can reconstruct a um, three-dimensional image of the distribution of the galaxy clusters that you can see here. And uh, it's a funny movie because some of you may see these things rotating in this direction and some of you may see it rotating in this direction. Um, the eye decides very quickly on one of the two and it's difficult to get the other one after that. But uh, it gives you a little bit of an impression of the distribution of the two. It's given in galactic coordinates and uh, the Objects in the southern sky in equatorial coordinates are painted red and the ones in the northern sky are painted blue, that's what you see. But what is most important is you can see that the galaxy cluster distribution is not a Poisson distribution. I think your eye probably already picks out that the galaxy clusters are, are clumped and you see lots of things and we later will see that we can identify a number of nice superclusters which are really very close together. Okay, since we have a fairly complete sample, well over 90% complete to our, with our estimates to down to a certain flux limit and we know the selection function of these galaxy clusters very well, we can construct uh, X-ray luminosity function of the clusters, count the galaxy clusters as a function of X-ray luminosity uh, per unit volume in a differential way. And this is the luminosity function we get. It's uh, the most precise of these X-ray luminosity functions of galaxy clusters. Here with the more than 800 objects from the southern sky. And it stretches over well, o uh, well over um, three orders of magnitude in luminosity. The thing we did here is we divided the, the uh, survey goes out with the most luminous objects uh, out to about a redshift of 0.5. 
And um, we have here determined the X-ray luminosity function in four different shells, redshift shells. Only the most nearby one has all the small groups in it because since it's a flux-limited survey, we only get the most luminous objects at higher distance. But you can see there is, seems to be no, uh, no very significant change between the luminosity functions that we have at different redshifts. We would expect that galaxy clusters evolve. If you go to higher redshift, we would assume that these massive objects haven't formed and uh, we can compare it actually to a theoretical expectation where we show here that is in retrospect produced what luminosity functions we would predict for our best fitting models that we get later on in the talk. So redshift zero is the red curve and uh, this light blue curve is redshift 0.5. So everything we have here is between red and green and that would be point, redshift point 0.8 and 1, just to, to show you that things are evolving in the luminosity function. But we do expect very little evolution here at um, low redshift. And that's partly affect the mass function does evolve more than the luminosity function, but we also have scaling, uh, changing scaling relations that when you go back, a cluster of the same mass gets more and more luminous in the past. And this is why this effect is so small. So we have basically not much evolution of the X-ray luminosity function between redshift 0 and 0.4. And we take them all together in our model fits. Uh, to go, what we have shown before, what can be predicted theoretically is the mass function of galaxy clusters. And we have now a little bit of a gap to go from theory to observations, to go from mass to X-ray luminosity. But if we have very detailed X-ray observations, we can get a mass determination through assuming that the gas in this dark matter halo sits hydrostatically there, solving the uh, hydrostatic equation from knowing the X-ray temperature through an X-ray spectrum and knowing the density distribution through the luminosity, through the surface brightness distribution of the X-rays, we can determine the mass. And we have done, that has been done for several samples. We did it uh, uh, at earlier times here for galaxy, for the 100 brightest galaxy clusters in the sky. That has been used with ROSAT and ASCA data. And we have a correlation between X the X-ray luminosity and the determined mass of the galaxy clusters. We have another sample, and I showed some of the cluster images of this sample earlier, uh, which is this representative Rexes sample. That has been done by very nice and deep uh, X-ray observations with XMM. And we can again uh, get, uh, get again um, correlation between X-ray luminosity and the mass of the galaxy clusters. And we can use this empirical relation to translate X-ray, uh, the, the theoretically predicted mass, into a luminosity, and then compare the predicted lumin luminosity function with the real one. These different, there, there are some other of these relations in the literature. One uh, very nice important one is that from Viklinin, which is very similar to the relation that we have here. But there are slight differences between two that re represent very well our uncertainty of these relations. They agree within the error bars. Having the possibility now to translate that, we can actually predict the X-ray luminosity from theory. Here I just take a plausible model, cosmological model with these parameters. Uh, Hubble, uh, you, everything is done with a Hubble constant of 70 uh, within this framework. And I just plot it over and fits very nicely. So the data are not uh, are quite plausible that we get. One of the things I will do uh, in the following analysis, I will not use a full luminosity function to fit cosmological predictions to it, because the scaling relations for the groups and the low mass clusters are not very well calibrated. And I don't trust that enough and uh, just cut it out not to spoil my signal. And I will just uh, fit. Most of the cl clusters are actually in, in this part of the luminosity function. I will only fit this part 
where I trust the scaling relations more than in this lower part. <coughs> and if I now try to uh, see what is the best fitting cosmological model, mostly the most important parameters that change the curve are the density parameter omega m and the amplitude of the density fluctuation parameter sigma 8. And if I look for the um, parameter constraints for these two parameters in the plane sigma 8 against omega m, I get these contours, 1 and 2 sigma contours for the parameters. But here I did fix on a certain scaling relations, and I did not allow an uncertainty of the scaling relations. If I would have a perfect knowledge of the X-ray luminosity mass scaling relations, I could get very tight constraints on these two parameters. You can see that we have really tight constraints in, in these two parameters. But then if I look, for example, the worst thing is the slope of the scaling relation. If I change it by a little bit, just 5%, I go along the degeneracy banana, and I jump out of these constraints uh, by more than 2 sigma. And the, actually, the accuracy that I should allow and the difference between two different determinations is more like plus minus 7%, which I should allow. Interesting is if I change the normalization of the <coughs> scaling relation, I go across the degeneracy banana, which is also an important movement and changes things quite a bit. And that is done for, about, uh, for changing things by 10%. The scatter of the relation has not such a large effect because we are fitting a large part of the luminosity function. So this is a minor thing to take into account. But um, especially the slope and the normalization of the functions are very important things. And the next thing, the normalization of the function is actually goes in the same direction and has the same effect as changing um, what we will call later. If the mass determination I don't, is not correct, for the mass that I put in the scaling relation and the hydrostatic mass that I measure is falling short of the true mass, which we expect from from n-body hydrodynamical simulation to happen on a scale of 10 to 20 percent because there is extra pressure in bulk motions and other components of the intragalactic medium. That goes in the same direction as changing the normalization here. So what I will do then in the following, I will allow an error in the scaling relations of 70% for the slope, of 14% for the normalization. This includes the error in the mass measurement, and I'll use a scatter of 30%. So can you just point to where 20% and 30% uh, hydrostatic mass bias would be on that? 30% um, hydrostatic mass bias would go up way here. Up there. Yeah, way up. But, and so 20% in between, which takes it a little bit closer to uh, the, to the Yeah, but we will have, we see some diagrams where we can look at it. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, Omega M uh, excludes uh, 0.3 and 2 sigma. Uh, not, I mean, don't take this uh, as the res our result, because that's okay. assuming. So th th wait for the next plot, because um, I, I fold in these things and marginalize over. And I also allow that our hydrostatic mass is measured low by 10%. But with a large error that I have, large uncertainty that I have over here. Then our uncertainty blows up, and we get uh, much larger uh, things. And they now encompass a lot of more possibilities. And that is what I would claim the result of our measurement, because we really are ignorant on, uh, we don't know the scaling relations so well. But it's still an interesting result compared to other measurements. and it has. For, let's first compare it to other measurements of these parameters using clusters of galaxies. There is, for example, work uh, with galaxy clusters identified in the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. They have samples of galaxy clusters more than 10,000, and uh, work that is led by Eduardo Rosso. And they did 
similar constraints of their cluster calibrating when measuring the, clus the cluster in the galaxy in a sort of galaxy richness parameter and these calibrate the richness parameter by uh, gravitation lensing towards the mass and then they can come up with similar constraints our constraints are a little bit tighter other sample of nearby clusters but with very high precision observations with Chandra from Alexei Viglinin give a degeneracy banana here it's much more degenerate in this direction and that is our result so with other cluster me measurements we are in very good agreement and another recent result of galaxy cluster measurements is uh, this is our reflex constraints these are the uh, constraints that you get when you use the galaxy clusters that have been detected in the Planck survey through the sunyaev seldovich effect to the shadows they cast on the cosmic microwave background at low um, frequencies but they are actually becoming this becomes an enhancement at high frequency and uh, the masses and the observations of these galaxy clusters have been calibrated by uh, partly our x-ray results so in terms of the mass calibration we are on the same footing but the survey is completely different and we have a relatively good agreement about the results so one of the uh, things that came out which ca are causing a problem if you take the standard cosmology especially the one that is now favored by Planck uh, or the standard cosmological model which is characterized by six parameters um, <coughs> and it's, it's a lambda CDM model with a cosmological constant and otherwise uh, a Friedman models and uh, if you analyze the microwave background data these are the constraints by WMAP these are the Planck results but from 2013 I come to the new results in a minute 2013 then you get a constraint for these two parameters from the CMB which lies differently but to get from here to here you have to make a pro projection from uh, redshift of 1000 or the time of recombination to today and there is a lot of things happening between and uh, the comparison here relies that it's a complete lambda a completely pure lambda CDM model to compare the two so, so your results are you're just using the scaling relation you're not using the universal pressure profile no it's just the scaling re relation between x-ray luminosity and mass Okay, so there is a discrepancy. I was hoping that this discrepancy might get resolved. This Planck is more calibrated, but when we had the meeting in Ferrara and the new results came out, not much happened. Some of the, I mean, especially these CMB constraints got tighter and tighter, and this is where the galaxy clusters lie. And uh, so this discrepancy is still here, and we have to explain it. One way is, of course, our mass measurement is incorrect. And uh, I can use Planck cosmology and try to predict how many galaxy clusters per luminosity in the X-ray luminosity interval we should see with a 10% underestimated mass or 10% mass bias. And then I get this curve, which is for most of the range is about a factor of two higher. We should have missed about half of the galaxy clusters in our survey, which is not very plausible. Another way to get these curves closer together is say the mass bias is not 10% by 45%. Then the things start to agree better. The shape is not exactly the same, but then I can change other cosmological parameters. But that's the mass bias that would be needed to bring the things in closer contact. A similar result has been uh, derived by the people from Planck, for the Planck clusters. They can also get the two things in agreement if we have this large mass bias. So, things are discussed in the... For a comment on that. Uh, mm -hmm. Hydrodynamic the laboratory, um, they give quite a scatter, but it does have a significant not so much in the 45 percent, certainly yeah. in the 30 percent. And so um, when we were first presenting some of this stuff at the uh, 
Santa Barbara meeting a number of years ago. No, uh, we got, how shall I say, it, attacked by Arnold and others that uh, we know everything perfectly. Um, and of course, that's not the case. And what they were trying to say is that um, uh, the determination of these uh, biases and relations are governed by a very carefully the Clinton selected cluster set where they combed out irregularities and that you can only use those and if you're trying to reproduce it you have to take your sample and you know take your fine polisher and try and absolutely mimic this highly selected sample. So I wonder if you have some comments on that you know, I'm sure you're pretty much aware of uh, that there is that sort of orthodox position which just never made any sense to me. Okay. When we look at clusters, we are looking mm -hmm. at a sample that's been largely selected because they're bright in x-rays. It's not because they're a special group. Yeah. No, we do have uncertainties on the scaling relations. I know uh, Monique's standpoint very clearly. She is focused on something. I, I see it a little bit broader than she does. So on the left-hand side, and this is a REXA sample, part of it was used to do the mass calibration. But especially for Planck, it was focused on the, as you say, on the relaxed galaxy clusters. And the justification to focus on the relaxed galaxy clusters then goes back to the simulations by Kraftsov, Viklinin, and Nagai. And they say, if you do the scaling relations and then X-ray luminosity, mass, or other parameters, temperature against mass, relaxed and unrelaxed clusters fall on the same diagram. But that comes from one simulation, and that's, I think, oh, I agree, that's the weakest point in that. On the other hand, we have this thing on the left-hand side, which also has a lot of uncertainties in it, the 100 brightest clusters in the sky that we use. That's a going across everything. but. The errors we make, of course, on the mass determination of something that is not relaxed is larger. And uh, I think there, there's still a lot of things that we have to improve, and we are on the way to do it. But on the other hand, I think we have, I, maybe I'm a little bit on the optimistic side, folding in a mass bias of 10% with an error of 14%. But, I mean, that's what we uh, but I'm not too. We did yeah. And uh, because uh, some of it was driven by our X-ray friends in our collaboration, they were very, very resistant about changing that bias. Yeah. First of all, they didn't have it, and then they were yeah. forced by the collaboration to change it, but they didn't open it enough. But they did show the uh, a fixed 80% uh, 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 number. Mm -hmm. um, and then, but they never had a tail going down further, and so it exacerbated what yeah. the issue. And uh, it seems, I mean, it looks like you're marginalizing over a fairly large thing. I would just say that the centroid should be shifted. I, I agree that, I mean, in the worst case, we could go maybe one third up to an agreement, but I would resist to go further than that. I give some arguments. Um, if you. So could I, um, yeah. Just ask another question here. Mm -hmm. So, um, because it's luminosity in, um, in X rays, it's sensitive to things like clumping. Yes. And so, um, that is in effect included in the sample of your calibration because you didn't select too much on clumping or non clumping. And the, the, the question is. I mean, that will also increase scatter, but the question is what kind of effect one might expect just from, you know, the, if, if you have clumps that you get a much higher luminosity that might not be reflected in mass. Yeah, I don't think it, the, largest, the largest problem of clumping is actually a bias in the temperature measurement. And that's what, so. Uh, that has been uh, tested in simulations. I don't, didn't include a lot of slides on that, but I can comment on that. If we have a galaxy cluster, which is a relative, we, we measure the X-ray temperature in rings and try to deproject the rings. But if each of the annuli where we measure uh, the X-ray luminosity, if it contains a wide range of densities or uh, under pressure equilibrium, it I mean, dense means then low temperature, 
less dense means high temperature, then uh, it will be the mean temperature will be biased towards the low temperature very much because lower temperature has higher emissivity because it's denser first of all and also the spectroscopic feature pull it down. So if we will not get the mass weighted mean temperature but something which people call spectroscopic like temperature that is biased low. Temperature is a very important parameter in the mass determination. Roughly I could say the temperature I mean the mass is proportional to the temperature but if we increase the mass the fiducial radius increases so it actually effectively temperature the mass is proportional to the temperature to the uh, two three halves so whatever error we do in the temperature goes into the mass and so the spectroscopic temperature bias would be the most uh, dangerous effect so different people uh, disagree in terms of simulations on how large this effect is. And for example, Elena Racia uses SPA, has in the past used SPH code, co codes, and they have lots of cold clumps in the clusters, and they get a very large bias because of this temperature, ef spectroscopic temperature effect, which go is as large as 30%. Nagai and Erwin Lau and other people using um, mesh codes, they get less and they are more like 10-15% biases because of the clumping. That's on the um, simulation side. So I have more slides on the observational side. Are we? No, no, that's fine. Yeah, okay. I have more slides on the observational side. Also there are people who say they can expl almost explain it. And there uh, have been uh, several new papers coming out on trying to calibrate the mass bias with weak lensing, comparing either Planck mass or X-ray masses to weak lensing masses. The most extreme result that uh, has triggered a couple papers was say that we understand why these things are discrepant and we can bring them almost into agreement comes from the project Weighting the Giants, Anja was led by Anja van der Linden, with uh, 51 galaxy clusters, a large, large number of them overlaps with Planck, they are shown here, and they say we have a, a bias, a mass bias of 31%, which is already two-thirds of, almost two-thirds what we need, the rest is error bars. Okay, that goes quite away, but then one can look... So, sorry, there's quite a trend there, right, with mass, right? Yes, I mean, <laughs> two, the other thing that is interesting, I mean, just to point it out, uh, the X-ray masses are tighter than the um, lensing masses individually. You have a large scatter. The, the uh, advantage of the lensing masses is really if you have a lot of data points, on average they should be unbi almost unbiased. And that is why lensing is so interesting. So also the statistics, even with 50, is, is not the largest, especially if you have another parameter that you vary. And I think things look different if you look at different samples. So there are a lot of things, a lot of projects, or several projects, where, where people do the same thing. There is a, a Canadian cosmology cluster project, which you probably are very f familiar with, and they now get comparing to Planck in the latest paper they get 24% uh, bias but in the earlier paper Madawi where they compared to x-ray clusters uh, if the bias was less I still have to understand what actually really happened here there's a locus project um, where there's hardly any mass bias seen after they have uh, corrected uh, have new masses now Weighting the giant is really the extreme outlier to the highest mass bias in the low end. Um, there are some smaller papers um, with, uh, by Grün and Stella Seitz, by people in uh, Bonn, and uh, including Alexei Viklinin on the 400D cluster sample and the CLASH project, and they actually don't see very much bias. We can see some of those uh, things in um, more slides. And then uh, there is another interesting paper uh, where uh, Melun and Bartlett used uh, the Planck data and they, you, you can actually see how the microwave background is lensed by foreground large scale structure 
that's an interesting result I also will show later. And uh, Miller and Bartlett have taken the massive clusters that uh, have been detected in the Planck survey. They use the X-ray masses and compare it to the lensing signal. And they also get very little bias. So there is also a large range here. And uh, this is only the most extreme of these results, which uh, moves the cluster constraints very close to the constraints of the microwave background. So, uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, they are different, but I, I should say locus because I show. Uh, I show a slide later that it's in good agreement with CCP, but they, that's just the claims from paper. It's in agreement, but... But they, they differ, but with, there is also a scatter. <laughs> okay. But if I take, uh, take one of the papers from the Waiting the Giants group, uh, you can see this is comparison to older uh, surveys, and that's an uh, earlier stage of the CCP clusters. They are above everything ap uh, above, uh, apart from the very old data from Peterson and Dahle, who have a large scatter. But one of the latest papers that came out is the one on, on the LOCUS project by Okabe and Smith. And here, first in the first panel, one sees that the LOCUS people have actually increase their masses quite a bit by improving their analysis that shows how much things can move within a few years. Uh, there is a relatively good agreement with the CCP project, but CCP is a little bit lower. <coughs> it's, uh, the locus mass is a little, just a little bit higher. This is the agreement between locus and clash. I didn't find the clash paper where they compare to anything, but this is what the locus, where locus overlaps with clash. But with weighting the giants, uh, the, the clusters from the weighting giants project are definitely larger than the ones that locus gets if you pick the same objects. And so this uh, is a very nice uh, representation of the inaccuracy. Again, this is. Uh, Planck masses divided by weak lensing masses. Now, it's now a paper from the uh, plot from the latest paper from the CCP collaboration, and that is a bias that the CCP people get. And this is weighting the giants is quite a bit off. So, and the last illustration to the last point. This is the exercise that Miller and Bartlett did. And uh, they get a little bit larger uh, signal for the lensing mass from CMB lensing in the microwave background compared to their input X-ray masses that they have. And uh, they get a bias which is slightly high by, I mean, lensing masses are higher by just about 2%, but it's relatively small. So we don't have a clear signal that uh, we have to introduce such a mar large mass bias. And most of the things actually would agree with what we did in our publication. And the last argument that w I would make uh, to say it's really difficult to allow such a large mass bias is one of our plots where we, where we plot how uh, have an accounting for all the stellar mass mm -hmm in the galaxy clusters and all the gas mass in galaxy clusters from groups to big galaxy clusters in several of our samples. And uh, we can add them up and get the total baryonic mass. We can uh, add another 10, 15% intra-cluster light baryonic mass on top of that. And then we get this gray uh, power law if we fit it to the data. This is the baryon fraction inside the clusters. And of course, we know that groups lose some of the baryons due to feedback effects, but big clusters contain most of their baryon. This is the cosmic ratio of baryons to dark matter. And we would expect that big clusters contain most of both of their matter. But if we would allow now a mass, and this is hydrostatic masses, if we would allow a mass bias of 40%, which would us bring us close to the um, Planck data, we would end up here. And that would mean that for the cluster regime here, simulators would have to, to 
be able somehow to throw half the baryons out of the galaxy clusters to make that happen. So if we allow a large mass bias, we run into another problem that uh, we wouldn't be able to explain. So question is, what could make it? And uh, I come to neutrinos. And if you, you can see here from these publications that some people have done that already almost at their baby age. <laughs> um, I have come to that very recently. And um, the idea about putting neutrinos into the game <coughs> is also a few, uh, quite uh, several years old. But it is the, uh, the following that if we have a power spectrum that's normalized uh, with a normalization parameter that is used for the time at recombination and with which the Planck spectra are normalized, and then we evolve it to today uh, with having no neutrinos, which is a solid curve, and then having more and more neutrino mass in that, neutrinos are damping the large scale fluctuations and you have less power on these scales. And of course, if you have these powers, if you reduce the power here, you get less galaxy clusters. If we use these different power spectra to determine sigma 8 and omega m, it will not vary too much because we are renormalizing these curves. I mean, uh, if we normalize integrating over these curves from here, then um, we will readjust the curves that they look very much similar over the range where gal galaxy, w which determines the number of galaxy clusters. And so if we fit cosmological model predictions to our data and then plot the different co constraints for sigma 8 and omega, we do not see too much variation. They for, um, the changes are within the error bars we have. And with galaxy clusters alone, we cannot say too much about neutrino masses. But uh, if we do something else, if we normalize these power spectra with a parameter that normalizes the spectrum on large scales at the time of recombination, and that's the parameter to which the CMB is directly fitted, then it looks different. And then the CMB results are here, but our uh, bananas are changing very much with the neutrino mass. And uh, we are just the one without neutrino mass, uh, which is the red curve, is just about, about uh, <coughs> I think I have the wrong, wrong plot. It should actually, the, this thing should actually like, should look like that. And it does, doesn't touch the uh, two sigma curve of um, of the neutrinos. This is unfortunately an old plot. But um, we get a good agreement if we, we lie in the middle of the data, if we give the neutrinos a mass of 4.45 electron volt, but we have very large uncertainties that we have to incorporate. So we can get the things to agree better if we damp the fluctuations by, by neutrinos. Uh, so, but let's recapitulate, recapitulate what we actually find. If, uh, if the density fluctuate, what, what we measure is the power of the density fluctuations at present with the number of clusters, we find too little clusters. So we actually have too little power on the large scale structure compared to what Blanc predicts. And uh, if you screen the literature, you find other uh, things which also predict too little, uh, how or see too little power compared to what Planck predicts. For example, we have the clusters, different works on clusters. The Munz et al. paper uses weighting the giants to make things concordant, but generally clusters, uh, other cluster work comes to the same conclusion that we have too little, the number of clusters is too small. If we look at another measure of large scale structure, which is redshift space distortions that you see in galaxy surveys, they have hints that there may be less structure in the nearby universe than predicted with Planck and the CM, uh, lambda CDM model. Lensing of large scale structure in uh, uh, lensing of galaxy shapes uh, gives an indication that uh, the power of nearby structure is too small and also the lensing of the microwave background itself. I'll show you a few things. but. The Planck 
collaboration using uh, the CMB data get an upper limit on the electron density which is just touching our lower limit. Uh, some of the BAO work comes out with a very low limit and especially Lyman alpha uh, structure analysis of the Lyman alpha forest comes out with a lower limit which is in disagreement with what we would what we would favor or at least touches just about at the error bars. That is one of the works with uh, galaxy samples from BOSS, SDSS BOSS, where the people look at rigid space distortions and constrain sigma 8 and omega and you compare things to Planck, you can see that their curves sit below the Planck curve. If you look at gravitational lensing, galaxy-galaxy lensing and uh, large-scale structure lensing, these two things that are the, the gray and green curves, they also go below the Planck curve and the clusters are the purple one. And this is uh, some of the constraints that Beutler, get, Beutler et al. get for the large-scale structure lensing and uh, <coughs> redshift space distortions. Another work, for example, from Ruiz and Huttera, they have looked at uh, several um, works. That these are BAO surveys, but they take a measure of the growth of large scale structure that come from redshift space distortions. And you can see this is a prediction of lambda CDM. And all the data points fall short of the structure. And taking everything together, lensing clusters and uh, rigid space distortions, they derive these constraints on the uh, neutrino mass, a similar way that we get it. But again, it's an indication that there seems to be too little large scale structure nearby than predicted by Planck and the lambda CDM model. And the last thing is so another weak indication, but still it's there. Um, these are again the Planck constraint in sigma 8 omega plane and these are uh, data points for, uh, for different uh, Hubble constants uh, for the CMB lensing, the structure you have to have in the foreground to lens the CMB in the way that we see it today. So all of these things are falling short and we need somehow, we need a way to explain that. Okay. I'll go a little bit faster and uh, do I have a few more minutes? Couple. Couple. Okay, I just say we work on super, super clusters and one of the things which is very interesting is that because we have a very clear selection function we can characterize super clusters very nicely. That is work that is mostly done by Ga Yong Chun and uh, since we can uh, compare it very nicely with simulations, we can select galaxy clusters in the uh, superclusters in the same way from simulations as we see it in our own survey. And we find, for example, if we um, take galaxy clusters, if we construct superclusters from galaxy clusters with a minimum mass of about 2 times 10 to the 14 solar masses, we get about half of the clusters that reside in superclusters, but they only occupy about between 3 and 4 percent of the universe. This is simulations and if you look in our data, this is what we get from the data. So we have a very clear correspondence of galaxy, uh, superclusters in the simulations and superclusters which we get and we explore them in different ways. And I'll skip over that and just go to the last moment. We can also look at uh, large scale structure in the nearby universe and if we make a plot of the galaxy cluster density as a function of redshift in the southern sky by making a prediction of how many clusters we should see in the survey, uh, making a prediction and dividing the real observed clusters by the prediction we get a curve like this and we can see that it seems with our census the density distribution of galaxy clusters is very homogeneous. We only detect this little trough in the nearby universe. And uh, we can look at that where this is situated in the sky and we see for example over dense regions by a factor of two. Uh, this is Shapley supercluster and the Hydro, uh, Hydra Centaurus supercluster for example. This is uh, less known superclusters at higher redshift. And there are areas where people have done very deep 
galaxy surveys and measure the density distribution of the galaxies. And if we just cut out these regions, south galactic cap, north galactic cap, and compare it to the same survey, density survey with galaxies, uh, then we, we see the following. We see in the south galactic cap, we have actually a local under density nearby and it's reproduced by galaxies and by galaxy clusters very well. In the north galactic cap, we don't see something like that. But overall, the universe is under dense, seems to be under dense in the southern sky at least. We are just exploring it in the northern sky. There is an under density, but it's not as large. If you take this under density by about 40%, but you take into account that galaxy clusters have a larger density fluctuation amplitude, which is called biasing, by roughly a factor of two. There may be an under density in, in which we live, which is about 20% low. That translates into a Hubble constant, which, Hubble constant, which would be larger by about 3%. And it will be interesting to measure that more and more precisely, because then one can cor correct local Hubble constants compared to the global one, uh, things which are measured by Cepheids or other things which are really with inside this low uh, density region in our universe. So with that, I want to end and leave my conclusions up on the backboard. Thank you very much. don't know it would happen of course for for all kinds of clusters because the mass bias is believed to be uh, because you have extra pressure factors in the clusters turbulent pressures bulk motions and other things and uh, also you may have this uh, measure a slightly lower temperature than you should that should happen at all masses but uh, there may be some mass dependence because um, the, may, la, the largest clusters are more in formation than the smaller ones. They, they may be more disturbed and that would, for, for example, imprint a, a tendency that, the, it's, uh, that you have a mass difference of the bias. Yeah. 